Good evening, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, what a joy it is to be able to sit down and relax and to hear from you as we go through your word. And we just pray, Lord, this evening that you open up your word to our hearts and our lives, that you would encourage us and help us, Lord, to walk by faith, to believe in the promises you've given to us, and then act upon those promises to do those things you've called us to do. We pray for again for the worship, Lord. We love to sing praises unto you, and may these songs bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 14 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And if you remember from our last study, we saw 12 spies entered into the Promised Land, the land of Canaan. And after 40 days looking at the land, checking it out, they reported back to the children of Israel on what they saw. And Ten of the spies said that the land is great, but there were giants in the land. The land is great, but their cities were fortified. The land is great, but the land was filled with people. What was the problem for these 10 spies? They looked at it through the eyes of man. They forgot to look to the Lord, and not just to look to the Lord, but to trust in the promise that the Lord made to them, that this was the land he had given to them. Do you think God was going to fail? Absolutely not. And this was not a surprise to them that God had given this land to them. He told them. I'll give you a few verses. First of all, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to land that I will show you. And then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And then we jump to Exodus chapter 6. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I will bring you into the land which I swear to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. In Exodus 12, 25, it will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised that you shall keep this service. And in Exodus 32, 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. You see, it wasn't that they weren't told of this promise. God told them that this land was theirs. He was the one who was going to give it to them. And again, the problem for these guys is unbelief. They did not trust in the promise of God, and they looked at the situation through an earthly perspective. And when you do that, you have to admit they were right. They were not qualified to defeat the enemies in the land of Canaan. But that was through an earthly perspective. But when you look at it through the eyes of faith, when God says, I'm giving you this land, God is not going to fail. That's a 100% guarantee. Do you think right now, when you see that all that's happening in Israel, when you hear people within our own government speak of Hamas and the Palestinians, that they will occupy the land from the river to the sea? In other words, wipe out the Jews completely. Do you think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. Why? They should be defeated. They are surrounded by over 100 million enemies. And on the other side is the Mediterranean Sea. No place for them to go. They should be defeated, destroyed, wiped out completely. But they won't because God said they won't. Do you believe in the promises of God? You see, that's the key, guys. These guys, yeah, they said the land is great, but, and when you put but in there, it's always a problem. Now, there was Joshua and Caleb. They said the land is great. They saw it through the eyes of God. The pro they trusted in the promises of God, and they said, let's go and take it. 
You see, they looked at the same situation, but they saw a different perspective because of what they were focused on. Joshua and Caleb were focused on the Lord and his promise. The other ten spies were focused on the enemies who were giants to them. And the eyes of faith, you walk. The eyes of unbelief, you're stagnant or you move backwards. And so here are the children of Israel. They're camped on the border of the promised land in Kadesh Barnea. They hear both reports. How are they going to respond? How are the children of Israel going to respond to this news that these ten spies are bringing? Are they going to walk by faith or by sight? So let's pick up Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. What are they weeping about, right? Think about this. God had promised this land is yours. These spies discouraged them. And obviously not a good response. Keep in mind that one representative from each tribe went in to check out the land, so they represented the heart of the entire nation. And as the nation hears the report from these ten spies, they're weeping, they're crying, because they felt that there's no way we can defeat the enemy. And like I said, it was true. They couldn't defeat it, but they weren't the ones who were going to do it. God was going to do it through them. But they didn't trust in the Lord. And they're crying out, all night long. That's the tragedy of unbelief. They are less than two years out of Egypt. Israel stood on the threshold of the promised land, and now unbelief was going to keep them from entering in. You know, think about this for a minute. As we read through the first 10 chapters of Numbers, Israel was fully prepared to live and go forward as people suited for God's promised land. They were ordered, they were organized, cleansed, purified, set apart, blessed, taught how to give and how to function as priests. They remembered how God spared his judgment and brought them deliverance. And here now they have unbelief. And this was, again, not just the ten spies. I'll, I'll show you. In Numbers 14.1, all the congregation. Numbers 14.2, all the children of Israel. Again, Numbers 14.2, the whole congregation. 14.7, all the congregation. 14.10, all the congregation. 14.10, all the children of Israel. Isn't it amazing how a small group of people can affect an entire nation? And that's what we see here. These ten spies, their attitude, their unbelief infected the entire nation. Now the entire nation, except for Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron, don't believe that they're going to be able to enter the promised land. They're not going to trust the Lord. And I think, you know, for us, isn't it easy to trust the Lord when everything is going well? Yeah, I mean, that's no problem. But what if things are a disaster? What if, how am I going to get out of this? What am I going to do now? Well, can you still trust in the Lord? See, this is where they're at. They're in trouble. We can't defeat this enemy. But what has God told you? That he's given you this land. And when we get into situations, you know, God, why isn't it easier? Why are there so many giants I have to face? That's the spirit-filled life, or life of the promised land. Promised land is in heaven. It's the spirit-filled life. Why do I say it's not heaven? Because there's battles in the promised land. And isn't there battles? As soon as we come to saving faith, we are facing spiritual battles every single day. And what God is doing for the children of Israel and for us is preparing us to walk. You see, we are going to face giants, and that's really not the issue. The issue is our heart, and are we willing to walk by faith and defeat those enemies, or are we going to walk by sight and let fear and unbelief cause us to be paralyzed and not move forward? God wants us to go, but there's always that choice for us. 
He wants us to walk by faith as he leads us. Well, look at verse 2 here in Numbers 14. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Now, they're complaining against Moses and Aaron for getting them into this mess. But here's the reality. They're complaining against God. Isn't it God who brought them here? Yeah, Moses and Aaron are just obeying what God is telling them to do. They're representing the Lord. And as they came against Moses and Aaron, it led them to complain about what the Lord had done to them. How he brought them out of Egypt to destroy them, their wives and their children. Wow, is that the picture of God they had? Yeah, that's what they thought. God brought us out here to kill us. We would have been better to die in Egypt. Wow, that's unbelief. That's what unbelief do, does. It gives us a clouded picture of the reality of who God is. And you can check this out on your own, but there is, no, there is not the fruit of complaining. That's not a spiritual fruit, okay? Uh, but there is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and it's manifested in many different ways, but that's just walking by faith. They needed to trust in the Lord, and they refused. And what did this unbelief cause them to do? We want to go back to Egypt. What does unbelief do in our lives? I'm going to go back to the world. Why not? What do I have to lose? At least in the world, I got to enjoy myself. Did you really? Are you really doing an, a, a good examination of what the world gave you? Because the world, look at what the world has for you right now. Death and destruction. God who has life and more abundant life than you could ever imagine. But that's where they're at. That's what this unbelief did. And they didn't want to listen to Moses anymore. They were going to pick for themselves a leader who would take them back to Egypt. That's just rebellion now. Unbelief led to rebellion. And that's what the Lord said in Psalm 95, 8. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. And they did this often. They did it at Meribah and Massa, where they complained about not having any water. And again, lack of faith. Psalm 95, verse 9. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. That was the problem. They saw God do miraculous things in their lives, right? Brought them out of Egypt. Brought them through the Red Sea. Caused the Red Sea to come crashing down upon the Egyptian army and Pharaoh, killing all of them. They had to Shekinah glory before them every day and night. And yet, they didn't trust the Lord. I think, how could they do that? And again, God goes, uh, Joe, <laughs> you need to listen to this one, okay? Because this is for you. These things were written beforehand that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scripture, might have hope. These are for our learning. You think the children of Israel are any different than we are? Absolutely not, because they're human beings. And I think we do, again, very well until difficulty comes our way. And when we start living like that, when you know things are great, we're on a high, and when things get bad, we're on a low, it's like a roller coaster spirituality. Can we trust the Lord no matter what? And I'm not saying, believe me, I'm not there. I still struggle, but it's learning. And it's asking the Lord, Lord, help me to trust in you more and more. You know, it's kind of like when you ask the Lord, Lord, help me to have more love for people. And God brings like the worst person into your life. Well, Lord, not that person. Well, you said you wanted to more love. There you go. Same with trials. Walking by faith. You want to learn how to walk by faith. It's not going to be easy. But can you trust me in it? And that's the key. You know, for me, one of the 
Psalms I love, especially going through tough times, is Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You could just feel the passion of David, can't you? You know, he's just crying out to God. He's overwhelmed because of a situation. He says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The rock is Jesus. And if I can place my feet upon the rock, I'm not going to be moved because that rock will not be moved. I need to be able to trust in him. Spurgeon put it like this. He said, so my brethren, let us strip our discouragements and murmurings of all their disguises and see them in their true character. And they will appear in their own naked deformity as discrediting God. It is true the difficulty before us may appear great, but it cannot be great to the Lord who has promised to make us more than conquerors. Absolutely. God created the heavens and the earth. He knows he's created the billions and trillions. Of I don't even know how many. I gave you numbers before, but it's incredible the number of stars. He knows them all by name. Do you think he can handle us, our problems? Absolutely. Well, let's walk by faith. Look at verse 5 here in Numbers 14. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. I find it interesting. Moses and Aaron didn't speak to the people here. I think they realized it wasn't going to help. And so what did they do? They brought the situation to the Lord. Lord, we're going to fall on our faces before you. Were they devastated by what the children of Israel did? Yeah, blaming God for this and wanting to go back to the world, to Egypt. And so their bodies and hearts are bowed before the Lord. And I think they're mourning over what the people of God were doing. And they prayed. And that's so important for us. Prayer. Can God change hearts? Yeah. Look at us. Every one of us. Prayer changes our lives, not God's. He doesn't need to be changed. Look at verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they, are, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Notice the difference between belief and unbelief. Belief is not based upon wishful thinking. Belief is based on the promises of God. And that's what Joshua and Caleb were doing, trusting in the promises of God. In fact, they say the, their protection has departed. Their enemies, the people in the land of Canaan, their protection has departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Don't be afraid, guys. Come on. God has taken away their protection. The land is ours. It's what he's promised us. Let's go and take possession of what God has already given to us. Now, on the other end of the spectrum is unbelief. And it looks for every reason not to walk by faith, not to go forward, not to do what God wants them to do. And what we see here is that as Moses and Aaron are praying, Joshua and Caleb are speaking to the people, reminding them of the promise of God. The land is ours. Let's go get it. How are they going to respond? Well, we don't have to wonder. We can read on to verse 10 here. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Can you imagine that? Here are Joshua and Caleb, you know. They tell the people, let's go. The Lord is with us. And they pick up stones to stone these guys. What a sad response. Why did they want to kill Joshua and Caleb? Because the carnal man cannot live alongside men of faith. And so they try to extinguish the light so they can live in darkness and be comfortable. 
Again, the contrast between unbelieving people and then we see the glory of the Lord. It appeared to them. You know, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, the light went on, but it didn't. The glory of the Lord appeared. They should have said, they should have fallen on their faces in repentance and said, Lord, we're sorry for our unbelief. But they didn't. They refused to walk by faith. Now, how is God going to respond to this? Look at verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Make no mistake about it, God is righteous in his actions towards this rebellious people, the children of Israel. And he says he's going to destroy them and start all over through Moses. God's going to fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he says, Moses, these people are going to be wiped out. Now, if we rebel against God, God will use others to do his work through God looks for people whose heart is faithful to him. Not perfect people, because there are none, but faithful people so he can work in them and through them. And for the children of Israel here, he had every right to wipe them out. But I don't think that's what God was going to do. Why? Well, remember about a year earlier in Exodus 32, verses 9 and 10, where they made the golden calf to worship God by? And God said to Moses, I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to destroy them. What did Moses do? Moses interceded for them. And I think that's what God wanted Moses to do here. Now, why didn't God speak to the people? Why didn't God just say to them, you know, what's the matter you or whatever? Because they didn't want to hear him anymore. They had tuned God out. God had already told them, I've given you this land. They didn't want to hear it anymore. And God wasn't going to give them more because he already gave them something. And they needed to take that step of faith first. And the same is true for us. You know, people say, I don't hear God speak to me anymore. Well, maybe you need to listen to what he's telling you and take that first step and see what the next step will be. Obey what he's told you. Verse 13 here in Numbers 14 and Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and that your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give to them. Therefore he killed them in the wilderness. Wow. You know, what we see here is Moses interceding for the people. And he says, look, God, if you destroy these people, the Egyptians are going to tell everyone else, look, you couldn't do what you promised them. You need to spare these people for your own glory, your own reputation. Now, Moses could have said, you know, Lord, I think it's a great idea you wipe these people out, man. They've been a thorn in my side for two years now, almost two years. I'm tired of them, tired of camping with these guys. Just wipe them out. Let's start all over with me. You know, I'm ready. I can do it. But he didn't say that. He interceded for these people because it wasn't about Moses. It was about the glory of God and the people of God. And that's, Lord, help me to have a heart like that for people that it's always about your glory and to have compassion for people. Verse 17, And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation, Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, 
just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. So again, we just see Moses interceding based on who God is and his promises that he made to them. You know, that's the heart of God being reflected in the life of Moses. He's other-centered. He's concerned about the people more than himself. And if Moses didn't inter intercede, God would have wiped them out because, again, his judgment was fair. They would get what they deserved. And for Moses, he doesn't appeal before God based on the goodness of the people. Why? Because the people who weren't good. He falls upon the mercy of God here. Justice demands punishment. But Moses asks for mercy. Don't give them what they deserve. They deserve death, Lord. I know that, but don't give it to them. We see it in Ezekiel 22, verses 20 through, or verse 30 through 31. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Therefore I have poured out my indignation on them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. We see Moses standing in the gap for the people, but in Ezekiel, no one did. There was no one who stood in the gap, and God judged them. You know, look at the days we're living in with the immorality that's running wild in this country. Do we deserve God's judgment in this country? Oh, absolutely. We, we are in your face, God, with our sin. We deserve judgment. But may we be like Moses and intercede for the people, for this nation. Ask God to have mercy on us that they would truly turn to him. May we be ones who stand in the gap and not like in Ezekiel's day where God found no one to stand in the gap. And I, I think that's kind of a mentality now of many Christians today is they just want destruction. Just destroy them, wipe them out. But what if before we got saved, people were praying for our destruction and not for our salvation? Let's have some mercy. Let's be compassionate towards these people who are absolutely doing things that are evil, but that's their nature. And we were there at one time. And God saved us and God could save them. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Wow. Did Moses change the heart of God? No. I think God always wanted Moses to intercede for the people. I think he wanted to spare these people. But he needed Moses to intercede. And I think, you know, I don't know where, where this nation, well, I ultimately know where the nation's going to go. But today, I, I, you know, I don't know how much longer this nation has. So, man, I want to intercede before, you know, the Lord calls us home. I want as many people saved as possible. Prayer doesn't change the heart of God. It changes our heart. And it changed Moses to intercede for the people. And I pray that God changes our heart to intercede for people around us um, that may be very nasty to us, may flaunt their immorality in front of us, but we have compassion and the love of God towards them. Verse 21. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So, this generation saw the power of God delivering them out of their bondage in Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea, destroyed the Egyptian army and Pharaoh and all that, gave them food and water in the desert, and they're refusing to walk by faith. And God says, because you saw all that I did, you're going to be judged for your rebellion. 
They're not going to enter the land that he promised them. But the next generation will enter into the promised land. The generation that they said would be destroyed are the ones that are going to desert or enter into the promised land. And it says they tested the Lord some 10 times. We don't know if it's a literal 10 times or it was much more than that. It could just be many more than those 10 times, uh, just using that as an expression. But their walk was unbelief in the promises of God, and that was a problem. Joshua and Caleb from this generation would be the only ones who would enter into the promised land because of their walk of faith and not by sight. They trusted in the Lord. And keep in mind, they're on the border of the promised land, Kadesh Barnea, but they're going to move away from the land. And really, for the next 38 years or so, they're going to wander in the desert, basically going nowhere. Verse 26 here in Numbers 14, we're told this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings which the children of Israel murmur against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have murmured against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection." I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Remember what they said back in Numbers 14.2. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. That's what's going to happen. They're going to die in the wilderness. All those that are 20 years old and up will die in the wilderness, And it's the next generation that enters the promised land. This was supposed to be a walk of faith. What it ended up being was the longest funeral march in history. 40 years. And that's what unbelief does. You know, you can't walk the spirit-filled life until the old man is crucified. The old man is put to death. Out of this whole generation, only two are going to make it into the promised land. That's out of... You know, 603,550 men that could go to war. Only two. Moses and Aaron aren't going to even make it in. And we'll see as we go continue through the word why. What can we learn from this as Christians? From this generation that just walked in unbelief. Well, again, Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my way. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Psalm 106, verses 24 through 27. Again, the rebellion against the Lord. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands." They didn't trust in the promises of God. What about us? Do we understand that when Paul wrote, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, that's a promise. We think that the Christian life is a picnic or it's an amusement park. It's a battle 
We are soldiers. We're in a war against demonic beings for the salvation of souls. Can we trust in what God has said and walk by faith? Nehemiah 9, verses 16 and 17. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their hearts, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. You see, they didn't live the abundant life. They didn't enter the rest that the Lord had because they rebelled against the Lord. They walked by sight and not by faith, and they were guided by the flesh and not by the Spirit. Now, Paul in Romans 6, verses 6 and 7 said, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. You see, the old life, the old man wants to keep you in bondage, while Christ wants to set you free as you walk in the Spirit. You know, Ephesians 4, starting in verse 20, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul's point is put off the old man, the old life, put on Christ. Because as you do, it will change you inwardly and your outward actions will reflect that. You need to crucify the flesh. Put to death those members. You see, you can't let the old man, that sin nature, that old life, live as you're controlled by the lust of the flesh. Because you become slaves to sin. What we need to do is crucify the flesh, the old man. Put away those things, walk by faith where there's that abundant life. Freedom from the bondage of sin, the rest we have in Christ. But there's the choice. Slaves to sin are free in Christ. And make no mistake about it, the old man can't be reformed. It has to be put to death and then the new man can walk. What many people want to do is Reform the old man. Make them better. Put them in programs. No, they need Christ. Because that's the only one who can change a person. Well, verse 36 here in Numbers 14. And the men who Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation murmur against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. So the ten spies that brought a bad report were killed. Joshua and Caleb, uh, they lived and they, entered the pro they will enter the promised land. You think, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Why was God so harsh on these ten spies? What did they do? They got the whole nation to rebel against God, to walk in unbelief. As leaders, we are responsible because people look at leaders, right? There's the story of a, this ship many, many years ago in, on the sea. and Huge storm. 
and people were fearful. You know, they were, had their life jackets on. They were worried to death. And they sent someone to, to ask the captain, are we going to be okay? As one of the guys went out there and he, he made it up to where the captain was, the front of the boat. And he looked at the captain and there was the captain. Hands on the wheel, facing straight ahead. Not a worry on him. The guy didn't ask a question. He just walked back. Everything's okay. Leaders are to lead. And we have to be careful. You know, it, it's really easy to get caught up with all that's going on in the world and, you know, put your hands on your face and go, oh my, but as a leader, why are you doing that? Isn't the Lord in control? Is, is the Lord up in heaven worried about what's going on on earth? Oh my gosh, I didn't see that one coming. That's a, wow. Where did that come from? I, absolutely not. So can we trust in his promises then? That no matter what comes our way, He's in control. He's going to see us through. It may be very difficult. Some people may lose their lives. People every day around the world, Christians are losing their lives for their faith in Christ. But again, we in America are living, you know, in an amusement park, thinking this is Christianity, and it's not. And when things get tough, we get worried. We get upset. It's not fair. We got to protest. Uh, okay, I don't want to upset anyone, but... Do you see anyone protest in the Bible? I find it very interesting you don't. What do you see them do? Proclaim Jesus. Why? Because you could protest all you want. You can change all the laws you want. But if you don't change a heart, what's going to happen? You see, the enemy knows this. And we are reaping what the enemy has done. Have you seen the protests of the young people standing up for Hamas that have raped, murdered women, children, babies that have been handcuffed and burned alive? And they're protesting in favor of them to destroy the Jews. Where did they get that from? From the schools. They've been taught. We need to teach them about Jesus because he's the only one that's going to change their hearts. We lost the kids. Let's get them back. Let's get them back. Let's be praying for these people that all of a sudden a light would go on, that the Holy Spirit would show them the truth and that they would come to saving faith. Can you imagine all these kids that are protesting now proclaiming Christ? Would that be awesome? That's why God was so harsh, though, because these were leaders, and they were leading the people in the wrong direction. Well, verse 39, here in, Exodus, in Numbers 14, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are. And we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Then Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned away from the Lord, the Lord will be, not be with you. But they presume or presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. Isn't this interesting? The people are like, hey, let's go take the land. We know we did bad. Let's go take it. And you think, oh, isn't that wonderful? It's not. Why is that not? Something to be excited about because the Lord said, it's too late. Don't do it. And so they are still rebelling, rebelling against what God had said. That's the problem. If it was true repentance, they would have fallen on their face and said, Lord, we're sorry. We accept your judgment and we're not going to, we're going to do what you've called us to do. But that's not what they're doing. They're doing their own things and they got defeated. 
there is no way, guys, we can succeed in the flesh. And that's exactly what they were trying to do. Their own efforts. We can do this. And God's not with you on this one. Don't do it. When God was with you, you, you refused to walk. Now he's not with you and you want to do it. Wow. Crazy, right? Well, look at Numbers 15, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you have come into the land you are to inhabit, which I am giving to you, and you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering, or in your appointed feast, to make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd or the flock, then he who presents his offering to the Lord shall bring a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering you shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice for each lamb. So the children of Israel failed to walk by faith and were judged for their unbelief, but God tells them, notice what he says here in verse 2, when you have come into the land, you are to inhabit, which I am giving to you. Who is he speaking to? Speaking to that next generation, right? Because this generation, 20 years old and above, are going to die in the wilderness. He's talking to this next generation. And he's talking about the various sacrifices, the offerings that they were to take with them into the land of Canaan. The fellowship and sin um, offerings. They're just, he's just preparing the next generation to enter in. Verse 6. Or for a ram you shall prepare as a grain offering two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-third of a hin of oil. And as a drink offering you shall offer one-third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a peace offering to the Lord, then then shall be offered with the young bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with a half a hin of oil. And you shall bring as the drink offering half a hin of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, again, we went through these offerings and sacrifices when we were in Leviticus. And the Lord, again, it's just teaching that next generation what he's going to require of them when they enter the land. And, you know, our offerings to God should be Filled with thanksgiving and joy, obviously. Verse 11, Thus it shall be done for each young bull, for each ram, or for each lamb or young goat, according to the number that you, are, you prepare. So you shall do with everyone according to their number. All who are native-born shall do these things in this manner, and presenting an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if a stranger sojourns with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generations, and would present an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Just as you do, you, so shall he do. Or one ordinance shall be for you of this congregation and for the stranger who sojourns with you. An ordinance forever throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourn, sojourns with you. So again, these sacrifices to God made with thanksgiving, the grain offering, and joy, the wine offering. And, you know, our, like I said, all that we do for the Lord should be joyful. It shouldn't be, oh, i got to do this again, right? I mean, is God really pleased with that? Absolutely not. There should be joy in what we get to do. And, you know, if you can't do it with joy and thanksgiving, man, don't serve him because it's not going to do you any good. Verse 17 here in Numbers chapter 15. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land to which I bring you, then it will be when you eat of the bread of the land that you shall offer up a heave offering to the Lord. You shall offer up a cake of the first of your ground meal as a heave offering. As a heave offering of the threshing floor, so shall you offer it up. Of the first of your ground meal, you shall give to the Lord a heave offering throughout your generations. Now, look at what it says here. You know, it doesn't say if you come into the land, right? It says when you come into the land. See, they're going to go into the land of Canaan. 
It's not an if. It's not a maybe. And when you do bring in the first fruits of the land as a heave offering, um, the heave offering was waved up and down, kind of a vertical motion. The wave offering was back and forth or horizontal direction. And, you know, for us, it's really about what the Lord has done for us, right? When it comes to our salvation, he did the work. And he finishes what he starts. I like that about our God. You know, Peter talked about it in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and it doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, Peter is dealing with salvation here. And he speaks of what God does in our lives. And he speaks about praising God for what he's done. You see, we can't change our lives. We can't change who we are. We're sinners separated from God. It's like Jeremiah said, Can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. There's the problem. They can't and you can't. You know, what does that have to do with us? Because apart from Christ, we're dead in sin. And the flesh controls our lives. We can't do anything good because it's not part of our nature apart from Christ. And yet, God has begotten us or we're born again in Christ. The old man's dead and the spirit is in control. And if you don't feed that old nature, which is still with us, that flesh, it's not going to be manifested. But whatever you feed will be manifested in your life. Feed the spirit. Be in the Word of God. Be in prayer. Be in fellowship with other believers. Study the Word of God. And the things of God will flow from your life. But if you feed the flesh nature, that's what's going to flow from your life. But in Christ, we're a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And man, what God has given us is safe. It's everlasting. It will never fade away. Everything of the earth will but not this. And it's incorruptible, undefiled. And again, like I said, it doesn't fade away. And God says he's reserved a place for us in heaven. Do you think he's going to lose that reservation? No. Now, I told you the story when years ago when I was going out to a pastor's conference in Costa Mesa years ago. Um, I was on a plane and... Um, we were a little late and I was sitting next to a guy and he goes, I hope we make it. Now, it's not really something you want to hear when you're on a plane. I hope we make it. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, well, we were flying into, I think it was Orange County Airport, and um, they close later at night because it's over, the airport goes by expensive homes and they don't want the noise. And uh, he goes, I'm watching the stewardesses, and they're talking. They're like, we're never going to make it. I was like, oh, great. Well, you know, my reser car reservation's at Orange County. Where are they going to take us? Well, LAX, which, you know, great, you know. It's a big airport. So, like, whatever. And we ended up making it to Orange County. So, man, we are the last ones there. There is no one in this airport at all. I find the, the rental car place, and, you know, Nobody's hardly there. So finally get someone. And I said, hi, you know, my name's Joe Guglielmo. I rented a car. Sorry, I'm late. You know, our plane was late. And they said, well, we gave your car away. I said, I reserved it. 
right? I reserved the car. Why did you give my car away? And I said, well, you weren't here. I said, I know. I was up in the sky. I couldn't call you. I, the plane was late. Finally, after talking with them, you know, they finally gave me another car. And you know me with directions. I'm trying to get out of their parking lot. And I went back into the parking lot where I had to pay again. I'm like, you know, I've been in here one minute. You know, please don't charge me again. And he told me how to get out. And I'm, I'm driving. And I'm, you know, this is California. And they go fast, I guess, in California when they're driving. So I'm, I'm driving and I'm going like 50, 60 cars are like passing me. I feel like a grandma on the road. Sorry, grandmas. But they are passing me like I'm going nowhere. So I'm going 60, 70, 80, 90. I'm at 100 miles an hour. I'm like, this is crazy. What is wrong with these people in California? They didn't tell me that my car was only in kilometers. There were no miles per hour on the car. It wasn't like you had both. So I was not really going 100 miles per hour, but I was going pretty fast. But still, it was a crazy night. But they didn't reserve my car. Do you think you're going to get to heaven and God's going to go, well, you're a little late, Joe. I, I gave that reservation away. No. And you know what? Peter says we are kept by the power of Joe or Scotty or Kim. No, we're kept by the power of God. So you think I'm secure in my salvation? Absolutely, because God is the one who saved me. Absolutely. And the work that he started, he will complete. What did he start? My salvation? He's taking care of everything in between, and he will take care of the ending of my salvation when I go to be with him. In fact, when he, Peter says, are kept, it's a Greek word that's a military term that was used to refer to a garrison within the city. So again, if God is over our salvation, do you think anyone's going to take that away? Absolutely not. In fact, Peter ends with receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I like that. He completes the work that he starts. Well, anyway, back here in Numbers, verse 22, uh, chapter 15, verse 22. And if you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments which the Lord has spoken to Moses, all that the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day the Lord gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then it will be if it is unintentionally committed without the knowledge of the congregation that the whole congregation shall offer one young bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma to the Lord, with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the ordinance, and one kid of the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was unintentional. They shall bring it their offering as a, bring an, their offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their unintended sin. It shall be forgiven the whole congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger who sojourns among them, because all the people did it unintentionally. And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in the first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally. When he sins unintentionally before the Lord, to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Then he shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, both for him who is native born among the children of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them. So again, if you sinned unintentionally, it needed to be un atoned for. Uh, the sacrifice had to be made. Um, and there was the shedding of the blood for the remission of sins. Um, you know, a lot of sins are committed with the best intentions, but it doesn't excuse the sinful result. Verse 30, But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be completely cut off, his guilt shall be upon him. So the word presumptually speaks of high hand or willful disobedience. Um, and you know it's right and you do the exact opposite. Flagrant, you might say. And they were to be cut off. Now here's the thing. 
When it says cut off, does that mean cut off from his people or put to death? Yes. You think it's a cop-out. It's not. It can mean both. And it depends on the situation. And we'll see that illustrated for us here in, starting in verse 32 of Numbers chapter 15. Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must be put to death, surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. So here's someone who sinned presumptuously. The Sabbath law forbid work on the Sabbath. It was to be a time of rest and uh, fit with family and fellowship with God. And This man knew the law, didn't obey it. And they arrested him. They waited for God to direct them what they should do. And the Lord said he needs to be put to death. Why such a hard judgment? Because it was in defiance of the Lord. And once you start allowing things to continue on, it just gets worse and worse. This man deliberately disobeyed what the Lord had said. And so he was put to death. Well, verse 37. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in their tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, and that you remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God, or I am Yahweh your God. So God says, put these blue tassels on the four corners of your robe, uh, blue speaks of heaven, um, and it reminded them they belonged to God and they needed to obey God. They needed to follow what he had told them. Um, you know, here's the thing, and I'll bring this to a close with this. How are we reminded about God that we belong to him? Well, I like what John said in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. We belong to God, we're his children. And one day we're going to be with him in heaven. We should be the most excited people in the world. You know, you look at all that's going on in the world, you go, man, is the Lord coming back? Yeah, I think it's really soon. What if it takes longer? Hey, I'm going to either be caught up in the rapture or I'm going to die and go to be with the Lord. Either way, I'm with him. There's the reality. So, for us, we need to read his word, trust in his promises. Don't live in unbelief. Believe what God has said and just walk accordingly. And we have the promise of his return, don't we? That should just be so exciting to us, guys. It's a promise that many Christians don't believe in anymore. What is your hope then? What are you hoping for? He, he's the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can't wait for another Walmart to come in. That's your hope, you know, or can't wait for a good presidential candidate. Good luck on waiting for that one. My hope is in Jesus Christ, guys. It's plain and simple. That's the one I can trust in. He never fails me and he will never, ever fail me. So I'm trusting in his promises. What he has said about the days we are living in. It's going to get tougher. Will it get tougher this week, this year, next year? I don't know when. I know it's going to get tougher. 
So I'm going to trust in him. And I'm going to say, Lord, as hard as it may get, help me to live for you. Help me to walk by faith. And help me just to walk, right? To keep moving forward. And sometimes it may not be a lot of steps, but I'm moving forward. Help me to do that. That's why, you know, in January, Lord willing, I'll be going to Russia again. People go, you're going to Russia? It's crazy. Why are you going? The world's nuts. Yeah, but God's not. He's still in control. There's work to be done. I know God has going to use me to speak to these pastors in Russia, to these churches in Russia that I'll be speaking at. So I walk by faith. I trust in him. And that's what he wants us to do. Not to live in unbelief, but to believe in the promises of God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for these lessons. And they're difficult ones, Lord, because I think each of us can look at our lives and see areas where we have not trusted in what you've called us to do. We wavered in our belief. How could you do that? How could this happen? How, what are we going to do? And we're not looking to you. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith, to keep our eyes focused upon you, no matter how difficult things may get, because you are in control, and you will see us through. Uh, you'll see us through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't stay there. We walk through it. And you always bring us to the mountaintop where we can rest and be refreshed before we go back down to the valley for more lessons. And we thank you, Lord, that you are patient with us. Help us to live accordingly and to walk by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.